this is Evan Mallett. I'm moderating this uh, wonderful panel. We've just uh, heard from some chefs uh, from around the country and um, talking about some really, really great stuff. I hope you had a chance to participate in that and to hear Ira Wallace earlier today, who was just amazing. So it's just an exciting day to be a part of. I'm very uh, honored to be moderating these panels. And um, we're gonna start off this next session with, uh, which is about seed preservation. You know, because you've clicked on it and probably signed up for it. So I won't uh, go into too much more detail about that, but um, we're introducing first Kelly Matsushita Tseng um, from the University of California, Santa Cruz in the agroecology program. Um, Kelly is Yansai, a fourth generation queer Japanese Chinese American living and farming on unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe, currently stewarded by the Ama Mutsun tribal band. Kelly's work focuses on building seed sovereignty as a means of cultivating community power and platform for working toward collective liberation. Kelly works with a collective of API farmers and organizers across the West Coast called Second Generation Seeds. Many of you may have heard of that, which focuses on preserving, improving, and breeding crops significant to Asian American communities. Kelly is currently working as an instructor at uh, the University of California in Santa Cruz. So we're going to turn it over to Kelly now for a presentation. Thank you so much, Kelly, for being a part of this. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Evan, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. So today is National Day of Remembrance, when Executive Order 9066 was signed, the anniversary of when the U.S. government incarcerated over 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans simply because of their background. Japanese farmers up and down the West Coast lost their farms, their livelihoods, and their communities. On the eve of Executive Order 9066, many of the Japanese who were farmers and gardeners had recently sowed seeds as spring was coming and planting season was about to begin. As people were transported to various incarceration camps around the country, some people tucked seeds into their bags, transported saplings, pots, or ornamental plants. Without knowing where they were going or when they would return, people began growing food immediately at the temporary assembly places outside the livestock stalls where they lived. Some people created decorative gardens simply for creating a source of refuge for people in the world, like the one you see in this image in the Manzanar garden. Hey, Kelly, can I stop you just for one second? I'm so sorry to do this. Um, we're having some sound quality issues. I don't know if it's the headset. Um, if you have an alternative microphone or could try unplugging the headset maybe and see if that's better. Okay. Let's see. Oh, that, that's good right now. How's this? Can we get people in the chat room to weigh in uh, on how that sound is compared to how it was? Okay. Is this better? That's a go. All right, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll, I'll start over. Um, so, uh, just to start over, um, today is National Day of Remembrance, the anniversary of when Executive Order 9066 was signed, and the anniversary of when the U.S. government incarcerated over 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans simply because of their background. Japanese farmers up and down the West Coast lost their farms, their livelihoods, and their communities. And on the eve of Executive Order of 9066, many of the Japanese who were farmers and gardeners had recently sowed seeds. It was spring and planting season was about to begin. As people were transported to various incarceration camps around the country, some people tucked seeds into their bags, transported saplings, pots, or other plants, not knowing where they were going or when they would return. Some people started growing food immediately at the temporary assembly centers outside of the livestock stalls where they were sleeping. Some people created decorative gardens simply for providing a source of refuge for people in camp 
like this garden at Manzanar that you see in the image here. After that, assimilation and forgetting your culture, your foods, and hiding your language became a means of survival. Throughout the Japanese American incarceration experience, threads of connection are either woven, maintained, or cut to land, just like the ume trees that thread through the remains of Japanese farms across California. With such a strong agricultural and land-based history, the Japanese community's sovereignty and self-determination was strongly influenced by their relationship to land and the forced land loss resulting from incarceration. So as children of immigrants or immigrants of various diaspora, in my work, we asked, how do we learn about the seeds of our ancestors? How do we remember or learn the knowledge that may have only been passed informally over the kitchen table or scribbled in the margins of the church cookbook? Who whispers to us the secrets of the beans, when to tuck them into the earth and how to sing to them, how to offer prayers that will nestle amongst their roots and take hold? For many, listening to the stories of our seeds may be a process of relearning. As a Yonsei, fourth generation Japanese Chinese farmer, seeds and plants for me have become one of my primary sources of connection to my ancestors and the main way that I have built community. But I think about how does land loss impact the ability of a community to retain its identity, its culture, and create community health? What happens when our communities are no longer land-based? And what happens when we lose the farmers of our communities, their knowledge of food, plants, and seeds? With my work with seeds, I tried to unpack the ways in which seed has been systematically and structurally removed from communities and understand how these patterns continue today and help support people to develop skills to disrupt these patterns. Countering the loss of memory, identity, and community health are the focus of my work. I'll share about the work of our growers collective that I work with, Second Generation Seeds. Second Generation Seeds is a collective of growers that works to preserve and steward seeds significant to communities of the Asian diaspora. Through creating collective infrastructure and resources for seed and story sharing, we hope to sustain, preserve, and expand knowledge of growing, cultivating, and preparing traditional and culturally significant varieties. Rooted in a framework of racial justice, we're working to shift the dominant narrative around Asian crops and reclaim ancestral legacies. Despite the immense diversity of crops and rich cultural histories and knowledge of ancestral food, foods in the Asian and Pacific Islander community, there is a lack of resources and technical information available for growers producing and selling these crops, especially for organic systems. These crops have historically been left out of breeding programs or only included in a very limited manner. Despite demand, there is <clears throat> also difficulty in accessing traditional and culturally important foods for many communities within the Asian and Pacific Islander diaspora community on both the seed end as well as the food end for consumption. And it can be difficult for small scale growers to create viable and sustained market pathways for Asian crops because of lack of access and historical exclusion to dominant distribution systems. So our collective works to preserve community and cultural knowledge strengthen, share, and make visible the rich and complex narratives that are part of ancestral seed heritage for communities in the Asian diaspora. Our project works to expand and build new pathways for ongoing participatory breeding efforts in order to increase access to culturally relevant foods that support robust and resilient regional food systems. <clears throat> and the work of our collective is taking place in the context of increasing access to a select number of bread and commodified Asian vegetables available in the US market, uh, increasing recognition and desirability of some Asian foodways as being viewed as healthy or desirable, and acknowledgement of restaurants in the fine dining scene beyond the Asian American community, but also our desire to push back against the monolithing that occurs with Asian vegetables in the Western market in which sometimes they're bred solely for agronomic traits 
outside of their traditional and cultural uses and occasionally even marketed with racist names from pejorative terms and marketed solely to upper income consumers attached, detached from their origins and history. <clears throat> we work to advocate for the production of culturally relevant and inclusive seed resources, as well as the ethical sale and distribution of API seeds. <clears throat> Our collective works in, <clears throat> in the context of difficult or no access to traditional varieties of Asian crops for many of our communities. The prolific hybridization of Asian vegetables, as well as the resulting loss of seed sovereignty for Asian American farmers, especially for crops in the brassica family. We're also in the context of the continued and especially recently increased xenophobia against Asian immigrants and the Asian American community, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. So part of our work involves asking, how do we connect people to plants and reconnect them to their stories? Here's an example of a coloring book that Namu Farm, one of our collective members, has created for their young community members to learn about a few of the many varieties of perilla. Our work involves selecting crops and plant seeds for climate resilient and culturally relevant phenotypes and genotypes. Climate resilience is an important piece of our work in seed stewardship. We saw that especially this year, as most of the crops that we grew for seed became adapted to fire, extreme fire and drought unintentionally. Some of the questions we ask in our work are, what does it mean to be a steward of these seeds? Our work is a project under the Kitazawa Seed Company, which is now over 100 years old and is a critical seed source for Asian American farmers. So what is our contribution to that history and legacy? This year, we collaborated on hot pepper, chili pepper trials, and together trialed and grew out dozens of chili peppers that were preserved in a seed bank from various regions of Asia across four different sites. Uh, the first farm that participated was Namu Farm in Winters, California, with owner-operator Kristen Leach growing Korean heritage vegetables using Korean natural farming techniques. Kristen has bred and developed a number of Korean heritage vegetable varieties over the years, notably the beloved Lady Choi chili pepper and Lady Hermit chili pepper, which are available through Kitazawa. And the second farm that participated was Shaoshan Farm in Bolinas, with owner-operator um, Scott Fleeman Chang. Scott grows Chinese heirloom vegetables and is focused on Chinese varieties of chilies and focused on Chinese varieties, varieties from the seed bank. The Im this image is a diagram created by one of the culinary partners from our trials this year, evaluating the heat levels of chilies that he grew. Scott grows a huge assortment of Chinese vegetables for the fresh market as well as restaurants across the bay. Uh, the next farm that participated was Kameyan Farm, just east of Seattle, owned and operated by Ari. Kameyan Farm is an herb, vegetable, and medicinal farm that also provides community education. Ari grows traditional Filipino crops and works with a number of community partners to help people build a reciprocal and reparative relationship to land. And Ari trialed a number of Southeast Asian varieties um, for the chili pepper trials. I grew out a number of Chinese peppers at the UCSD Caspis Farm, as well as a number of Korean and Japanese peppers. This spread that you see here is from one of our tastings with a restaurant partner, the ramen shop. During the year, each of these farms participated in growing, evaluating culinary and agronomic traits with restaurant and community partners, as well as seed duplication. So, during our trials, we work to both duplicate seed as well as assess the culinary and agronomic traits. Now, some of the seeds that we worked with had not been grown out for 20, 20 or 20, more than 20 years and had surprisingly good germination. We observed the size, shape, color of the peppers, the uniformity within plants, as well as variation. We looked at plant vigor, health, resilience, and pest and disease resistance. And we also looked at the harvest windows and yield for each of these plants. Some of the significant varieties that I worked with, one was Yao Chao, which was a pepper with a lot of variation. Um, 
which was not very super spicy, but similar to a pepper that is commonly used as a green frying pepper or um, in Szechuan. And often people would eat it with pork. Um, so this pepper had a very poor plant canopy and was a little bit susceptible to sunburn. Um, so in this next year, we're hoping to grow it out and see if we can select for some, some more uh, strength and vigor in the plant. Another pepper that I worked with was the guilin, which is potentially related to a ghost pepper cousin in China. Um, this pepper has a really top of your mouth dry heat, very spicy, and it's good for heat without a lot of flavor. It's potentially similar to this Shaoshuan pepper, which is from the region of Guilin in China. And traditionally, people would use it for something like hot pot, where you take a tiny pot of the pepper and swish it around in the hot pot. And it allows it to impart a spice without Im impeding or changing the flavor of the hot pot too much, as cuisine in the Yunnan region is very delicate and clean and emphasizes the purity of ingredients. I also worked with a pepper called the Issei pepper, which was similar to shishito, but hardly had any recognizable spice. It was delicious red and productive with lots of variability, however, as you can see here in the variability of the sizes and shapes of this pepper. The Issei pepper had a lot of low seeds in some peppers, and in some of the breeding, we thought that maybe there was a cytoplasmic male sterile male line that it came from. So I'm still investigating to see if this is um, a land race, what the origins and history of this variety are. So each of the farms essentially utilize community and culinary partnerships for people to track uh, historical attributes and culinary traits. Some of the things that we looked at was what are the aromas of the peppers? What heat levels do they have? Where do you feel the heat in your body? Is it, does it linger? What types of flavors do the pepper have? Is there a terroir, like a mineral taste, a saltiness, or perhaps some specific influence from the land because of the soil? We looked at culinary applications, what types of um, things people might use these for and have traditionally used these for, whether pickling, oils, drying, chili sauce, fermenting, roasting. And we also looked at pepper traits, such as what is the stem length, the size and shape of the pepper, the quantity of seeds, and the types of skin and colors. So the points of exploration in this project were many. Um, in the process, each of us digging into our own relationship to our heritage, as well as situating the work that we do in the food system against this work. And I was reminded of the complexity of this work, thinking about the the reflection of it being an Asian American experience and discovering that many of these varieties have a recognizable flavor or nostalgia, but perhaps look differently because they're grown outside of their homeland. And so thinking about what traits are most important and significant um, to community was the process. And this process also shared insights about the history of Asian seeds in the seed industry. For instance, a number of the Korean chili pepper varieties that we grew appeared to be abandoned breeding lines um, before Semenis acquired two of the main seed companies in Korea in the 1980s, paralleling the opening of Korea to a broader global economy and the widespread hybridization of varieties. So our next steps are to again grow out some of these peppers and to look at how their traits are in a bigger population and perhaps start selecting for specific traits. Um, the Issei is one that I will definitely continue to work with as it was delicious and extremely popular. So just to conclude, um, our work is really about building relationships with seeds and with community and plants. Remembering that the seeds that we're working with are living, breathing entities and that seeds are tangible ways that we communicate with our past ancestors and future generations. And we work with an understanding that when seeds are held out of their context in ex situ conservation methods, or just saved for the sake of biodiversity as a material resource, there are serious shortcomings of that in terms of us being prepared as farmers for resilient farms and food systems. So our collective asks 
What do seeds mean to communities in diaspora? What does it mean to be a steward of those seeds? How do we continue to hold at our core work the sacredness of seed and our responsibility to that relationship? Thank you. Well, that was amazing. Um, and the depth, eloquence, thoroughness, and detail uh, of that has left us with very few specific questions. Um, a lot of comments, uh, a reference to Kitasawa as a, a, a great resource and a link to a podcast with the owners um, is, I think, you know, what, what we've seen from commentary so far. Uh, people will have a chance to add their thoughts uh, for the Q&A at the end after we've heard from everyone. Um, I'm personally struck after uh, starting my day with this incredible session with Ira Wallace about um, the populations of oppressed and enslaved people uh, trying to, and using your phrase here, Kelly, remember the knowledge. Um, that's a really powerful statement and something that, you know, you're, you're effort with second generation seeds is uh it's just it's so impressive in its scope and the mission to be able to try to recover that knowledge and create a permanent resource just spectacular so i want to thank you and i know everyone else does too for the amount of time that you put into this and we're, we're very very grateful um we are due for our next um presentation so Thank you again, Kelly. We're going to now bring on uh, Daniela Dutra Elliott, who is at the University of Hawaii. And Daniela is a seed grower and professor of horticulture at University of Hawaii, Leeward. And she's born and raised in the Bahia region of Brazil. Uh, she's got quite a story. She immigrated to the United States as a teenager um, and had lived elsewhere before moving to Hawaii. Uh, and she has collaborated with the Hawaiian Seed Growers Network to select locally adapted cultivars and improve the tropical seed production quality. She also conducts varietal trials as a tool to explore the connections between plants, food, and culture with community college students of diverse backgrounds. Daniela's current work uh, sprouted out of her graduate research on the sustainable wild harvest of culturally important plants. And this included seed physiology, propagation protocols, and pollination biology. I'm super excited to hear from Daniela. And let's see, here she is. So I'm gonna go away, Daniela. Thank you again for being a part of this panel. My pleasure. Um, I guess I will share my screen. Um, okay. So um, when I was asked to give this talk, I, I wanted to talk about things that really like are meaningful to me and to my work. Um, so really connecting the foods from like ancestors to the seeds that we keep it's something that i think about it all the time and i work with so i thought it would be appropriate um just a little bit of background information on how i got here i i was born and raised in bahia and the on the east coast of brazil and it's a very diverse culturally diverse amazing place uh, with a very strong afro influence and really the mixing of uh, different cultures. Um, I don't have time to go into that right now, um, but there's a really strong history there um, and it really shapes who I am and the foods I eat and the, the, the plants I grow. Um, and again, when I was a teenager, I migrated to Florida and I got to go to school in Florida and have an immigrant experience in the US. Um, so my family is still lives in Florida and I get to go there once in a while. Um, but, um, I then, uh, arrived in Hawaii maybe 12, 13 years ago. Uh, and that's where I call home. So, um, I, um, I have a question related to this, um, 
to this presentation that I always carry with me and um, which is uh, when you leave a place, what do you carry with you? So it doesn't really matter if you left that place yesterday or if it was your ancestors who left it. Um, I feel like this question uh, for a lot of uh, immigrants, um, it kind of um, brings back these uh, different aspects of the things that I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, so just hang in there with that question. Um, but I really wanted to first acknowledge uh, the people and the place where I live. Um, Native Hawaiians have an incredible cultural uh, connection to plants and um, Polynesian navigators arrived here and with them they brought about 24 species of food crops, medicinal crops, really important, important crops, important enough that they carried with them. Um, and this is alive and well here. I can go outside right now and see those crops grown. Um, and people are very connected to these crops. And um, I think it's very cool that um, um, there are all these species that are brought in, but also they left Hawaii and went to South America and picked up sweet potato. Um, so it's a special connection that uh, Hawaii has with uh, South America right there. So um, after contact in 1778, um, then lots of immigrant groups started to arrive in Hawaii for um, all kinds of reasons, but mainly plantation work. And with people arriving, also new crops arrived. And, um, and it's what we have today, it, it really shows this mixing of cultures and uh, of the plants that people brought with them. So I work, I teach, I teach agriculture and my classroom, um, my students are very diverse and I learn so much from them every day. It's quite amazing. Um, and I really try to bring those connections to plant and culture as part of teaching. And um, I, I truly love uh, going outside and uh, just I teach mainly outdoors. Um, so um, part of this process of teaching you also it impacts you because you also like see how important it is the food that you eat and the food that your ancestors ate and the things that I learned to cook uh, from my family is what I crave and what my child that was born here also craves because I make it for her and when my family visits Brazil this is the first thing that they send is normally a selfie or a photo of this dish. This is just one of the examples of the dishes that we're very connected to, and it's called bobo de camarão. And um, this really is an example of a food that has many different cultures mixed in. Um, and if you uh, go visit my hometown, people will tell you that this is, uh, a lot of people love this dish, and it's a seafood stew that is thicken with cassava and cassava manioc is polenta. Um, it's um, now grown all over, but it's native to the Amazon and it's a really important root crop and it has been taken everywhere. It's in Africa, it's in different little islands in the Pacific. So now it's an important crop all over the place, um, but it's an indigenous food in, in Brazil. Um, and then what you have there too is uh, coconut milk. Uh, so it's an African influence and palm oil. And um, palm oil, um, it, that's what adds this uh, uh, reddish coloration to the food. Uh, and of course you have rice here. Uh, so uh, in, introduced by European influence. Uh, so this, this dish um, means a lot to me. Um, it's a celebration food. Um, and um, when I moved to Hawaii, I was so excited to see cassava growing and I immediately connected to it and started growing it myself. And, um, you know, for a lot of immigrants, the idea that you can access food from your home country is really important. And, you know in a, you're in an immigrant community when you see all those little stores and tiendas uh, that people can get uh, ingredients. Um, 
normally those ingredients are either frozen or in cans or dried, so they're not fresh. Um, so to have fresh cassava is a big deal because normally you would get something that it's either frozen or it has been waxed and shipped such long distances that it doesn't even taste good. So just awesome to be able to grow this. Um, and then um, there's a specific ingredient here uh, that is, that's what I'm adding here. It's um, um, chili pepper uh, that is called pimenta de shadow and it's um, a pepper, uh, it translates to uh, smell. So it's a pepper that gives um, smell through flavor. It's um, quite an amazing ingredient to add. And I was really afraid of it growing up because I love the flavor, but um, you, you, in, you put it in the food uh, in your stew whole, so you don't slice it or anything. And um, a lot of times, um, if you're not careful and your stew is a little chunky, it may end up in your mouth and you may bite into it. And uh, if you're a child, um, it may be too spicy for you. So that has definitely happened to me a few times. Um, but so hard to get this fresh pepper here. It's not really used dry. It has to be fresh. So when you start looking online and it's just really hard to find seed. So you can see here, uh, there's like misspellings, but also not enough information and um, just three different things, completely different. These are definitely not the pepper I was uh, looking for. And these are just uh, a few examples of what you can find online. So a few years ago, I went back to Brazil. I got some permits and I started just talking to people and collecting and and discovered that really this pepper is so diverse, uh, shape and flavor, and the name really doesn't always match with the variety. So the pepper I probably grew up eating um, may not be available anymore, or it's so specific to a, a little community that um, just really hard to find. Uh, so it, there's a, I think there's a really important need for people who um, want to connect with their foods to be able to access like really good information uh, of varieties and be able to connect with those stories. So uh, just a couple more examples of the diversity of these peppers. And I'm not alone with this. Like I asked friends to send photos of the crops that they grow here in Hawaii that they're very connected too because of uh, ancestral foods and I got sent so many amazing photos um, of corn and chili peppers they are specific to the foods that they eat and they celebrate. Um, and this is another friend of mine who grows traditional uh, crops, uh, uh, kalo, but on his mother's side he has Mexican ancestry so he also grows corn and makes his own tortillas of all these amazing uh, heirloom varieties. So um, one thing that we all talk about is how hard it is to get good seed uh, and seeds that are that really connect us to the, the food that we ate, uh, that we ate in the past. So I feel like I wanna close by saying that there's a really, um, there's a need for more information and connection. And, um, I was inspired by these three different books. And it's interesting that a lot of people talked about braiding sweetgrass and the cooking gene. So this is a theme in this summit. Um, and I wanna add one more, which is uh, Peppers of the Americas by Maricel Priscilla. And those are the kinds of uh, literature that I think um, can really impact the way we see plants and we see seeds and that connection that we have with these crops. And um, I think seed companies have a big responsibility. I think growers have a responsibility as well. Um, and I'm just, I just love the work the Hawaii Seed Growers Network does. They not only have a little information in their catalog about varieties, but they, when they release a new variety, they also release a blog. And that blog post has detailed information about the variety, where it came from and how people got the seed. And I really appreciate that. And I, 
I hope to actually contribute more to that work because I think it's important. And um, so um, that's what I want to leave you with is that those connections that we have with our food, our seeds, and it's really important to tell those stories. Um, and I'm going to end here. Uh, <laughs> that's beautiful, Daniela. Thank you so much. Um, so we have no specific questions right now other than uh, that last screenshot that had the three books. Um, we've had someone else reference a book in the chat room as well, um, which was not one of those three. And um, so if we can get those links in the chat room, that would be really, really great. And I would also throw it out there, Daniela, if uh, you have, I, I love Brazilian food. Um, and would love to know if you have any uh, recipes that you're, you'd be able to share or give us a link to uh, favorite sites of yours or family recipes or anything like that uh, in working with cassava. I've only ever been able to use the waxed variety that has traveled a long distance, unfortunately. Um, so I don't have the benefit of being right on the island with you, but um, we do have one question that just came in. Uh, and that is from Susanna, who says, I'm curious, how do your students share their seed stories? Um, yeah, it's just really interesting. Um, you know, people have really strong connections and um, it really depends what kind of background they have. Sometimes I find out that, you know, they farm right behind the college um, and um, that has happened a few times and we go on a field trip um, and they they share all kinds of cool stories and um, and I, I have a student right now who lives on a farm on the west side and she has all these amazing Filipino crops that her family grows and uh, it's just so rich in terms of um, the the amount of information and connections that people have so um, we have little projects that we do in class and they get to uh, share some of that. Great. Uh, question from Dorothy. Were you ever able to replicate that smell of your childhood pepper? I love that story and I think we all wanted to know the answer to that. Did you ever get there? No. <laughs> I haven't given up. I haven't given up. I, I, I'm going back and... Um, where my family's from is this really tiny uh, town um, on the countryside. And I've been in touch with uh, neighbors there um, through social media. And I know who now, uh, the person who owns that house and she said she has the chili peppers. So I hope to, um, to visit someday and get it. We, we've had a, a local farmer who grows out the biquinho pepper, which um, I believe also is of Brazilian or at least Portuguese origin. I'm not sure if it, it came by way of Brazil. Is that one that you're familiar with? Yeah, yeah. That's a, a common pepper in, in, in Brazil. I, I grow it here. I grow the two, the yellow and the, the red. They're really good. Yeah. I, I cooked with it last night. So. Yeah, yeah, as a chef, I can tell you, I love that pepper and was so excited to, to add that to, to the repertoire. So um, thank you very, very much. Um, one quick question from Eduardo Fernandez, who asks, could you talk about the cassava varieties? In Colombia, there's yuca dulce and yuca brava. The latter uh, requires processing because it is poisonous. Do you know enough about uh, cassava and yuca to be able to elucidate that a little bit? Yeah, so the we call it bitter varieties or sweet varieties. Yeah, like so um, in Hawaii, most of the varieties here are sweet, so we don't have to worry. We can um, just boil it and throw that water away. Um, so really easy. But if you were in Latin America, you really need to be careful. They're really difficult to tell apart. Um, and the bitter variety um, will kill you and it, it kills livestock. Um, so you need to, yeah, it has to be processed. People love it though, because it's processed into flour and, right. um, and that keeps for a long time. So 
yeah, definitely got to be careful between the sweet and the bitter varieties. Chefs always, or at least like demented chefs like myself, always like uh, the challenge of working with something that's potentially toxic or lethal. Uh, so I'm going to seek that one out. Um, but we do have to move on here. So thank you so much, Daniela, for your story uh, and for that just rich culture that you've brought with you and been able to leave a place and take it with you. And that's a great, uh, a great little piece of, of immigration knowledge that, uh, you know, we all would benefit from knowing, and I personally am grateful for you sharing that. Up okay. next, we have, thank you. Um, up next, we have Heron Green, um, who is uh, from my home state of Maine. And uh, I had a restaurant for a little while in, in the mid coast and uh, was made familiar with his work when I was there. Um, he's got an impressive uh, history that began in St. Alden's, Maine, uh, which uh, was at the, uh, he was a child of Back to the Landers, or Back to the Landers, as we called them, a uh, longtime gardener turned farmer, seed saver. Uh, his day job for 20 plus years has been with Fedco Seeds in Maine. I'd say it's a lot more than a day job. Um, but you have, you, we will put a link up here for Fedco Seeds. I think uh, we may have already posted that, but uh, we'll put it up again. And uh, so it's a worker consumer cooperative uh, and an amazing seed catalog where he currently runs the research and trial program. How much fun is that? And help, uh, helps write the catalog as well as innumerable other daily operations. Combining a passion for plants and his day job skill set uh, culminates in plant breeding and rare variety preservation work on his personal farm. Heron serves on the board of Organic Seed Alliance, which is at uh, seedalliance.org. We'll also put a link to that. And implements community seed education and outreach programs for the Freed Seed Federation. Helping to organize regional plant and seed events and strengthening uh, our regional seed community are his personal goals. Uh, he's a fountain of knowledge and a very, very thoughtful uh, seed preservationist. So I look forward to hearing all of his knowledge, and I'm sure you all do as well. Please, uh, as we are entering into Heron's presentation, be thinking about questions that you will have at the end of his presentation for all three of these amazing presenters. Um, I know I've got a few, but uh, I'd like to see some more come in the chat room. So thank you, and I'm going to leave the room now. Heron, it's all yours. Okay. I uh, just want to make sure my sound is good. Everybody's been a little bit of sound difficulty today with folks as we've been getting into the room, but um, nice to see Evan again, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this panel, and much appreciation to my co-panelists for their stories. Uh, I'm actually going to start off a little bit with just a uh, anecdotal story, uh, which is the root of so much of my experience of living in central Maine. I grew up in St. Albans, was actually born in the house that's up the street from where I live now. Um, they finally tore down the old farmhouse uh, about two years ago. Um, so I haven't moved much um, and seeds are somewhat part of that story. Um, in my late 20s, uh, sorry, in my late teens, early 20s, I, uh, I came into a situation where I had a severe immune system disorder um, that has curtailed, had curtailed most of my life. And uh, for me, seeds were a way to travel the world or travel beyond my hometown um, and then rare seeds uh, started to be something that I understood wasn't that I needed to travel the world, but they were in my own backyard. Part of how that came to me was actually um, a bag of beans. So this is uh, Jacob's cattle bean um, grown by a friend and a close uh, confidant, uh, Patty Qua of the beanery. This is over a couple towns over from me from Exeter. And this is a one pound bag of Jacob's cattle beans. Now, when I was growing up, baked bean suppers on Saturday nights were uh, de rigueur for any type of fundraising that was going on, whether it was a church or a community event like a, like a sports uh, booster. Um, and everybody had their favorite bean. And the most favorite was Jacob's cattle. And I, I never really thought about it. You know, everybody knew of the bean, 
But I also noticed that they were never the beans that were being used in baked beans and cans. And I also noticed that they are really only available either from local growers, bean growers that everybody would go and buy directly from, or in these really local packed beans. And uh, I didn't think much about it until a farmer friend of mine um, asked me where he could get some Jacob's cattle beans. And it turned out that basically yet again, over the course of about 20 or 30 years of my life, um, we see food changes. And what happened was nobody was growing Jacob's cattle anymore. All the old bean growers had retired, had sold their equipment. Uh, the land had become you know, potato land or corn land. Um, and there was only one or two people growing Jacob's cattle bean. Uh, and I thought that was really strange. And I also noticed that all the bean suppers were going away. Uh, I happened to start working at Fedco Seeds and along the way I met a man uh, named John Meter, who is the son of a famous plant breeder called Ellen Meter. And John handed me a bag of beans, a bag of Jacob's cattle beans, and they said pike strain. I had no idea what pike strain meant. And then I discovered that the origin of that story is a better story, um, that the Passamaquoddy Indians, which are the uh, owners and indigenous land stewards of the down east section of Maine, um, which is the far eastern point of the United States. Um, this bean, the Jacob's cattle bean, apparently originated in the hands of the Wabanaki Abenaki nation of which the Passamaquoddy are part of. Uh, and the story from the colonials part of things is that a fellow named Joseph Clark was the first uh, white uh, European child born, he was an Irish descent person uh, in 1788 in that part of Maine and that these beans were gifted, quote, I'm gonna leave that in quotes because history you don't know, by the Passamaquoddies to uh, his family. And it turns out that this bean had been stewarded by this person, Joseph Clark's family, actually his grand, his son, or sorry, his son-in-law, the first Jacob, also Jabez, known as a, actually as a pirate. So Jacob was born in 1825 and was both known, had some piracy stuff going on, kind of an infamous character, but was also a butcher. He was the person that basically ran a, a meat market slash butcher shop slash basically uh, stealing cattle. Um, and that's actually the origin of the, were the name Jacob's Cattle. A lot of folks thought it had something to do with biblical uh, stuff, it doesn't. Um, and this family basically maintained this bean uh, in their region for a very long time. So at that point, it's a very much common bean in down east Maine, which is a segment of Maine, but not much beyond that. So I'm gonna share my screen now, uh, if I can. Hey, Aaron, can I, can yeah. I take this pause uh, to point out yeah. that we're, we're getting a lot of crackling um, coming, it, it started okay, but we're now, we're now hearing um, some crackling in the mic. I don't know if you need to adjust the headset. Well, uh, turn it on and off. Does that help? Still getting that crackling. Okay. Well, hold on just a second. It's almost like static. I don't know how to how to fix that. Well, I have another mic. Hold on. Okay. A just give me, give me a second, uh, and let sure. me share my screen, and I'll. And while he's working on that, um, thank you again, everyone, for your, your patience. We, uh, by virtue of having uh, so many different uh, voices from so many different forms of technology around, around the country, including uh, the Hawaiian Islands, uh, it's, it's definitely a challenge. So here we are. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, <laughs> Escher comes to mind. Um, Heron, now you're muted. If you wanna give that a try by unmuting. Let me see if, uh, let me see if I can, is that? Okay, you just came off mute. 
Still a little crackly. Thanks again, everyone. I like um, Mimi's contribution that Buccaneers were pirates who jerked beef on a kind of Taino barbecue called a bukai. That's cool stuff. Unmute, Heron. Oh, great. I think you got it. That's the way to go. OK. Can you I'm hear a little us? trouble sharing my screen? Um, is there something I'm not familiar with? I did this the other day, and it worked just fine. I apologize, audience. You're hitting the same icon at the bottom? I am. Mm. I, I think the best way to share your screen is to open up your uh, whatever you want to share first. Yep. And then um, you, when you share screen, instead of sharing the whole window, you look, share application, and then you click on the specific application that you want to share, be it PowerPoint or whatever it is. Is that working? Okay. Well, it should, but it's not. Hmm. Uh, but uh, you know what? I'm just gonna just gonna go for it. We're All right, our phone. you're doing okay, great. We're loving your story so far, so just keep on. Okay, going. we're good. So basically, what this story I want to tell is actually a story that folks that have helped me with this story: Emily Haga from Seed Series Exchange, Dr. Eric von Wettenberg from UVM, and Kristen Moria from uh, who's a master's graduate from Cornell. All of their stories, as well as all the folks that uh, they have learned from, come into this. So Emily Haga uh, is the executive director of Seed Savers Exchange, and one of the core beginnings for Seed Savers Exchange being a germplasm uh, repository was the work of a man named John Withy, who was born in 1910 in, in Gorham, Maine. And um, John was a really amazing person, had an amazing career as a as a medical photographer. Um, but also was a crazy enthusiast for beans and started a project called the Wanigan Associates uh, that was derived from his specific interest in searching out the Jacobs cattle bean that in 1960, when he went back to find his childhood love bean that he loved making baked beans with, discovered in 1960 that he couldn't find Jacobs cattle bean anywhere. Um, and in 1930, I have some refer a reference book called The Beans of New York, which is a cataloging of all the beans. And you discover that at that time, Jacob's cattle was still really only specific to certain regions in Maine. And John had grown up with this bean, but didn't realize how rare it was. And when he turned his back and went off to Boston, he apparently the bean got so rare that he couldn't buy it and make his favorite baked beans 20 or 30 years later. So he started this whole movement of collecting rare beans throughout the whole US, but primarily for New England. And at some point in the 1970s, he basically gifted this collection um, to the, uh, the beginning stages of Seed Savers Exchange. And Bean One is a Jacob's Cattle gasless. Let's just frame that for a second. And Bean Two is Jacob's Cattle. These are actually the first two beans, actually, I think the first four beans in the, Jacob, in the uh, Seed Savers entire collection are, is Jacob's cattle bean. And that's how rare this bean had gotten, was that it was almost impossible to find. These little bags of beans, you couldn't find them anywhere in 1960. So thankfully, there was a you know resurgence of interest in baked beans and Jacob's cattle bean, and the bean came back. But we find ourselves in kind of a similar predicament now, where there basically are only sort of a handful of medium to large scale, and I say this in a quote, New England way, of folks growing Jacob's cattle bean, um, and they're starting to become less and less common. Now, I want to circle back to some work um, that uh, Eric von Wettberg is doing at UVM with the paleoethnobotanist uh, named Dr. Fred Wiseman. Um, Fred Wiseman is a Wabanaki tribal member, as well as an ethnobotanist, and they're doing some amazing work looking at all these different heirloom beans. And those heirloom beans throughout New England are of a unique type. There's two sources of domesticated bean, common bean in the, in the world, and those are Central America and South America. And for some odd reason, all the heirloom beans in New England 
are from the South American origin type. And so there's a lot of questions about how did this get here? Because even though there's definitely a lot of evidence that uh, sea trade and seafarers all over the place were bringing these beans um, from their travels, it's also very evident from the European history that uh, of Jacques Cartier, for an example, that beans were being grown commonly by uh, American, you know, Indians, Native Americans uh, in the 1500s, and these beans were already here. So they're trying to figure out how did these South American beans get here, which is an amazing mystery of both the basics of an origin, but the expansiveness of how do things travel and the story that, geez, it's not just white people on boats that bring things everywhere. So these sea canoes that folks were traveling up and down the Eastern seaboard, one starts to wonder how all these beans got to New England. So part of this next story is Kristen Laurie at Cornell starting to do some amazing work where she starts to ask, geez, there seems to be a lot of beans that kind of look like Jacob's cattle, different colorations, but they have different names. And there's these different strains of Jacob's cattle that the, all these seed companies are carrying. Are they the same? Are these all genetically the same? When I go back to this book that I mentioned called The Beans of New York, which I can't show on my slideshow, um, they basically started categorizing things early on genetically, or I guess using the Linnaeus system, um, by just their color or just their size. And, you know, basically just because one dog is black, another dog is black, doesn't mean they're the same breed of dog. So they were just classifying any bean that was a certain color as if they were all related, which we obviously now know is not true. But Kristen basically took all these unique speckly beans that are all over the place, and she did a whole different types of sequencing and, and growing out to sort of see, are they related? And what she discovered is some of them are and some of them are not. And so there's definitely some things that are being called Jacob's cattle bean that are actually from this Central American point of origin and some others, they're part of this, you know, basically the two, two different parts of origin. So there's these two different types of beans that look similar, but are not the same. So we start to get into this interesting concept of, geez, we have all these spotted beans uh, from both say the Anasazi bean is an example of one, but then we have this bean all the way over in down East Maine that looks similar, but is completely unrelated. So these stories start to be even more uh, interesting. And then Kristen also was looking at finding the Jacob's cattle bean that you know was sort of traditional. And she was looking at finding some disease resistance to cross in and begin to make breeding crosses to breed in some new diseases that are particularly fungal disease resistance that we have issues in New England, which are one of the reasons why this heirloom bean has become such a challenge for folks to grow is because there's become more and more funguses with uh, the climate change type of stuff that we've been dealing with. And this particular bean is relatively susceptible to it. The cool weather of the down east environment was really particular and this bean does great there. But it's actually known that when you grow Jacob's cattle historically, it's been said, if you grow it in a hot area, you get more diseases. So we come across this sort of impetus to breed more, and that seems like a new thing, right? Well, the interesting thing about this Jacob's cattle bean is that it has had so many different people's hands and very interesting people that have touched it, like John Withy and like Fred Wiseman. But within the family, the Pike family themselves, there was a, a fellow named Alger Pike, who, uh, oh, sorry, Radliff Pike, who was part of three brothers, uh, Sumner, Radliff and Alger, who are the grandson of the person who the Jacobs cattle bean is named after, grandsons. And um, Radcliffe was a plant breeder at UNH. And he bred uh, a variety called gasless Jacobs cattle with his family heirloom and crossed it to a Mexican black turtle bean uh, to eliminate um, the some of, sort of some of the disease issues, but also made it more digestible. Uh, and for a while there, it was kind of like a, a thing that everyone was really interested in the idea of a bean that didn't give you gas. Uh, so it, the, the interesting thing about the, the family itself who's been stewarding this bean 
then becoming a plant breeder, uh, and then trying to improve upon that bean. And that Jacob's cattle gasless bean was bean one. And oddly enough, in the Seed Savers Exchange collection, and oddly enough was the first bean that John Withy found that was given to him by his father-in-law, which was the Jacob's cattle gasless bean. Uh, and that Jake, that Pike strain of Jacob's cattle, because Radliff Pike had gone to work in New Hampshire at UNH, he disseminated his great grandfather's beans or grandfather's beans uh, to all of his plant buddies. And uh, the same strain of Pike bean was given uh, to, uh, to John Withy by the Hepler Seed Company um, as the Pike strain. So we start to see these stories fold and unfold, and we start to see that modern research is trying to share with us where these journeys have been, where have we been, where have these beans been, and all the different travels and stories that, quote, preservation has. We discover that preservation is really the telling of all the stories. It's the telling, and as if you could think of it as an epic movie, of these amazing people and all their journeys. And we get to ask ourselves, is it the amazing people or is it the amazing bean? That's the story, that's the question I keep asking myself. The deeper I look, whether it's pirates or politicians or people who served on the Atomic Energy Commission or bean collectors or preservation movement or geneticists, somehow this crazy bean is the common thread. I think it's the crazy bean. So that's my story. Aaron, that was amazing. I, as a, as a um, recent Mainer, only 20 years in the state as a resident, I can say um, that you have served our heritage and legacy well with your storytelling. And no slides. <laughs> Without like no slides, hands. exactly. You had no crutch. Amazing. So thank you. Um, I just reached out to uh, everyone to see if we have any questions. I've learned a lot uh, from listening to all three presenters and Karen specifically. Um, I, I'm a, I've been a devout fan of Patty Qua and her uh, work at the Beanery for a long, long time. And last time I spoke to her, um, she did she did a delivery for me when I was in the mid coast and she brought me um, you know, three or four varieties, which are pretty sacred, including the Marifax bean. Um, and Jacob's cattle was another. But anyway, she told me that she was going to be no longer distributing her beans, but I'm, I'm comforted to hear that she's still growing them, at least. Is that true that they're not commercially available? She's still distributing them locally. Um, so there's definitely stores in my little area that are carrying them. But yes, my understanding is, is that she and her uh, husband, Danny, have, uh, are not distributing widely. And they had at one point been growing somewhere between 18 and 30 acres of beans a year and are now growing about three. Oh, wow. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's got its own cycle um, of production and it's also, you know, farming. And uh, one of the reasons why Patty is amazing is that every one of this, these bags of beans has gone over a, a bean treadle with Patty sorting out By hand. the beans. Right. So that's the old way where the machine that looks kind of like a sewing machine with a felt rolling table and a person basically sitting up listening to the radio or watching their favorite shows is going like this and knocking off the little rocks and all the beans that aren't perfect. And that's one of the reasons why Patty's beans are the prettiest Jacob's Paddles in the universe. I, I would say the same about all of her beans. It's that level of care, yeah. exactly. Um, well, we do have uh, a few questions coming in. Um, I was wondering, Heron, if you wouldn't mind opening the bag, pulling out a bean and putting it really close to your camera on your screen, because I think someone mentioned they're a visual learner, and I think we'd all like to see this legendary bean up close. Whoop. Yeah, awesome. And so, Aaron, is this variety the one that was hybridized with the Mexican black bean? Is this from the, the castle? Uh, no, this is the original. Okay. 
the uh, the gasless Jacob cattle turned out to have like a very tender skin. It cooked very quickly, so it was actually kind of desirable. Um, Unless you're but it doing a main baked bean, right, which has to cook for twenty four hours. Exactly. So if you're doing bean whole beans, it didn't the traditionals we weren't interested. Um, but you know, like in the age of Zoom, you know, the gasless part doesn't really matter because we're not all hanging out right. together. So you wouldn't know. Right. <laughs> no, this is the tradition. Well, thank thank you also for sharing the information about Fred Weissman. We got a lot of commentary um, and people sharing some links to his amazing work. Um, as a you know, I think you mentioned he's in the Wabanaki, right? Of of the Abenaki Nation, yes. yeah. Vermont. Yeah. So um, yeah. and just some great reads uh, from him. So I'd like to invite our other panelists to come in now um, as we have amassed a few questions. I see Daniela is in the queue. And here comes Kelly, wonderful. So everyone, please use that chat room for any questions that you have. Um, because I'm the moderator, I'm, this is my uh, privilege and uh, I'm cheating here by starting with a question that I had way back to when uh, Kelly was making her presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit, you used an expression, monolithing Asian vegetables. And mm -hmm. I'd really like to know more about that and how uh, we can all learn from that statement. It, it was very, it was precise, but um, unfamiliar to me. So would you mind just talking a little bit more about what it means to be monolithing Asian vegetables? Sure, sure. Um, so I would say that monolithing anything or Asian vegetables in particular is just the assumption or um, practicing assumption that, you know, there's just one type of this thing and it, it is all that, um, you know, for instance, um, I think uh, daikon is a good example. You know, um, a lot of Western growers sort of just have a image that daikon is just daikon radish, but when mm -hmm. in fact there's so many types of daikon radish that grow at different times of the year. You know, Japanese daikon radishes are long and thinner. Korean daikon radishes are shorter and squatter. Um, and so in the end, they have different qualities for different types of preparations. So one daikon radish is, you know, more particular for this thing, for this particular type of pickling treatment compared to another. So when I, when, when we talk about monolithing, it's or pushing against the monolithing, it's just mm. kind of breaking apart that idea that there is just this simplified version of something, whether it's a daikon radish or, or a bok choy, when in fact there's, you know, thousands of types with different uses um, and different properties for the different uses. Right. What we see is in, in um, contemporary breeding, um, there is this tendency towards monolithing in the in the organic seed world in which, you know, those traits are lost from their uses and we just see, oh, this daikon radish grows well, pest resistant, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I know there was a, um, a, among this crowd, I know a well, well known cover story on, in National Geographic several years ago highlighting the number of varieties of each uh, common vegetable and uh, that were once extant and now uh, how we've narrowed that down to, to only a few. So that's a, that's a really great point when we think about uh, vegetables that we'd be thinking about the diversity and, and biodiversity there. Um, we had a question from Kelda who asked about peppers, uh, specifically um, she says, uh, I have such difficulty, even with electricity, getting hot pepper seeds to germinate, given that some take weeks to germinate. Any idea what older non-electric techniques might be out there? I think that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. I, I don't personally know a lot of older techniques. I imagine anything where there's warmth. Um, even if it's not from an electric source. Um, Maybe we should ask the gentleman in Midcoast, Maine, uh, what can be done to germinate uh, with a limited growing season? Any any techniques non-electrically? 
Yeah, I, I used to start all my peppers uh, next to my wood stove um, and, in, and basically would use a, a dome um, over the tray. And you have to immediately remove that dome. As soon as you see the little curved neck, you'll see a little curved neck of this, of the seedling started to emerge from the cell, you know, from the seed. And you got to immediately remove the dome. And then, so it doesn't get too leggy, but basically it just, you have to start them early. And I used to start mm -hmm. my peppers right about now, or maybe next week because mm -hmm. they're, they're very slow. Some people also use um, a spritz of a chemical called can O3. Um, mm. potassium nitrate, which is basically an organically allowed uh, germination uh, booster. So those are a couple of different ways to go. That was a great answer. Thank you. I know I've, I've been a victim of overly leggy uh, germinations. Um, so thank you uh, for that. We have also uh, a comment from Mimi about the Taino Arawak people who came uh, from South America into the Caribbean. And sh this person is suggesting that maybe the South American bean varieties came via Taino culture, um, which has a three sisters type of garden called Konuko in the Caribbean and maybe came up the Gulf Stream on a pirate ship. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, transmigratory processes that uh, indigenous societies were traveling and sharing information across thousands of miles. Um, there's a lot of evidence that, for an example, that the Incan Empire uh, was well aware of what was going on in the Aztec Empire during conquest, even though uh, folks were telling, didn't think they could. So the traveling of the beans to me is not a surprise. However, they've gotten there. I, I suspect it was strictly in indigenous, indigenous hands originally. Great. I, I want to go back to Kelly for just a second. Um, I had a, she, she mentioned a couple of things. Uh, first of all, like, what do you attribute a 20 year old seeds successful germination to how, how, how did that work out so well for you? Um, I don't know, but we, you know, I think I had them on heat and made sure that the soil mix had an adequate dry down and moisture um, and temperature. And I think those were the, those were the key things. Um, another question for you, Kelly, uh, when you had your slide presentation, you, you referred to Perilla, which is uh, otherwise known as Shiso. And I'm just curious to know uh, why, are you choosing the, the Latin name? What was the reason for calling it Perilla? Uh, well, so I, you know, shiso is what folks in the Japanese community use, but there's many types of perilla um, mm. utilized in many different Asian communities. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, that's the, that's sort of the broader name that folks know, I feel, mm -hmm. but, you know, every community also has their own name for, for, for perilla. And then within that, their own names for the various types of perilla. So mm -hmm. there's a lot. Um, I'm sorry to pick on you, Kelly, but we have a question from Sus Susanna. Um, if you feel comfortable, could you speak to your experience of becoming reacquainted with your community, cultural knowledge and food? And what has that journey been like for you and second generation? Oh, thank you for that question, Susanna. Um, it, it has been a journey. I feel that it's both a journey of understanding what my identity is as an Asian American, what that means in relationship to the work that I do. And it's this, um, it's this experience of being both feeling deeply connected at times and then deeply lost and like having points of confusion or, or, or misconnection. Um, and, you know, some examples of that are when we're, when we were running the pepper trials, for example, um, us trying to, you know, and, and Daniela spoke to this a little bit about, about how the naming of different plants is really confusing. And sometimes folks in different regions have their own name for the same plant or variety, and sometimes there's different names. So us trying to understand the language that was used to name these plants and then the language that people use who traditionally use them is a whole process of trying to 
it was a whole process of like how understanding how we fit into that story um and i think for me you know as a as a fourth generation japanese american and uh i feel both you know i haven't had connection to my farming ancestors um for three generations even though they were farming ancestors before world war ii um when folks essentially lost connection to that land so you know i think for me that work is both it feels deeply um personal and and so important and yet there's this there is a sense of um, like loss and longing at the same time as well. And I think similar, similarly to other members in, in my collective, you know, we all have our own unique experiences from our communities in the Asian diaspora, but we have shared that, ex that shared experience of connectivity, longing, and then also um, experiencing how our communities have interacted with the seed industry, for instance, um, you know, the hybridization of Korean peppers in the 80s and how many Korean the Koreans from those generations don't actually know the names or identities of those peppers um, before that time. So a whole range of experiences. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's it is a personal um, story and uh, I appreciate taking that question. Um, we had a question for Daniela, which I think is a great one. It's coming from Phil. Uh, what are the challenges of growing in Hawaii and finding uh, a source of seeds, especially heirloom varieties? Has that been a challenge for you? And if so, how? Oh, it's, that's a good question. Uh, so Hawaii was so isolated for so long that there are not a lot of pests and diseases here, but then with the introduction of all these different plants and people carrying things with them, we have pretty much everything you can think of. So pests and diseases, it's really, really difficult. Um, but also um, a lack of support for breeding programs. Um, so I think there are a lot of really amazing people working on this issue. Um, and a lot of people know how hard this is because everybody right now really wants to support farmers and new farmers, especially. And whew, we don't have a winter, you know, if you in low elevation, the temperature kind of stays the same. So the past, it gets a little cooler this time of the year, but the past and diseases just keep on reproducing. If you live, live in higher elevations, you get a little break. But um, it's definitely challenging. A lot of the times, heirloom varieties will not grow here because they just can't handle disease pressure. So there's definitely a need to, you see this a lot with people breeding corn, this need to sometimes breed resistance into varieties. And yeah, some people feel comfortable with that and others don't. Interesting, and the the idea of introduced species uh, on an island, of course, is obviously ecologically something that you guys must think about all the time. Um, so thank thank you for that, um, Heron. We we have someone who wanted uh, to get a, a map, uh, for lack of a better word, of um, the various varieties of uh, the Jacobs cattle bean, and uh, the as a they wanted to see if there is like a, a way to trace their interconnectedness or, or genealogy, again, for lack of a better word. Um, is there something like that that's out there? I think part of that is something that Kristen Loria, uh, the grad student, uh, master's grad that I spoke of at Cornell, uh, I think that's part of her sort of final draft is some sense of how these beans that she was looking at are related and where they're from. Um, in terms of where the samples were from or where we think they're from. Um, I think a lot of the history of food uh, is an amazing map. And I think that the beans in general um, have always been fascinating to people because of the colors. Um, but the, I, I can imagine this map and I'd love to see this map occur. And I think it would really be eye-opening for 
a lot of us just also the story of peppers you know mm -hmm. uh, two people here speaking of like the story of peppers and there's so many cultures and so many journeys that have brought peppers all over the world um in unexpected ways and then back to their points of origin even from those other places so mm -hmm. i think that's the beauty of what we're what we all get to interact with and i would also want to uplift um uh, some work by in Hawaii. Um, there's a, some folks. Uh, Glenn Tevis is a plant breeder, and um, good uh, Glenn and his wife Jane always say, "Maine so romantic." Uh, they, I, 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 I'm thinking in Maine. I'm going, looking outside, going Hawaii so romantic. <laughs> uh, but I think the pepper story would be an amazing map as well, going back you know, as far as we can go and just keep building that map. You know, everybody's story here is part of that map today going forward, not just going back. So I think those are also the, the going forward is, is important too. Um, well, I, I have a, a, a question I, I want to get to, but first I want to field uh, the question that Allison, our organizer, uh, has posed just a simple definition of diaspora. So we've been talking about that term all day, um, which has, uh, you know, its roots in, you know, mass migration of cultures and, and things like that. Is Does anyone feel like enough of an expert about diasporic cuisine or diaspora in general to, to give that definition? I don't either, so that's, <laughs> that's fine. Um, but again, I guess, Allison, um, you know, when we hear earlier today in the session uh, with Ira talking about the African diaspora and how that's informed Southern, the American cuisine of the South, that, uh, you know, that is a reference to that, pe that, that population, that enslaved population bringing those seeds and that, those techniques um, to their captors and then the the captain we have a frozen um i was wondering uh well, until evan comes back kelly could i ask you a question sure yeah i i really would love to just you know share that I constantly tell people that um, the true lovers of vegetables and the true breeders of vegetables are really like the greater Pan-Asian, you know, community. And I'm wondering, how do you feel today about like, do you still feel that richness of both overlap of heirlooms and hybrids in, you know, in traditional farming? Is there, how do, how are those traditional varieties uh, in situ in their own country being stewarded. Do you have any sense of that? You know, depending on the country, you know, are there movements in the countries that are holding those true? There, there definitely are, but you know, there is just has been such a strong loss with the push of green revolution and hybridized seeds that even in places where there's such strong agricultural traditions, um, I would say that, you know, that that hybridization and monolithing is pushing into those areas. Um, and so there definitely is, you know, a great example is the Korean Women's Peasant Association. They do incredible work um, creating native seed banks and distribution sites across and between actually North and South Korea. Um, and yet, you know, with um, essentially <laughs> South Korea changing so rapidly from an urban, from an agricultural country to um, to what it has become today, you know, this hub of electronics and production. Um, there, there is a big sense even there with the loss of knowledge around varieties and uses. Um, and so, you know, I feel like here there's such there's such such immense hybridization of Asian vegetables. And I do understand, you know, I do see the hybrid vigor that occurs in a lot of things. 
and I also sometimes appreciate it as a grower but um, I think there's a real loss there when we're when we're looking at um, sort of the continued pigeonholing of crops just for their for their hybrid vigor and properties um, we start to lose a lot And Daniela, welcome back, Evan. Yeah, Evan, we still, can see you, but we can't hear you. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Daniela, I wonder, in your experience in Hawaii and also in Brazil, what would you, how, can you also speak to what we call in the United States heirlooms? How are those surviving in, with modern, you know, pressure? Are, are there groups and farmers that are holding fast? Uh, how are those movements, are they strong? Oh, so, uh, yeah, Brazil being such a huge country, um, it's kind of hard to just talk about it, but um, there are some regional uh, groups working really hard to preserve seeds, um, but um, we also have a really active um, uh, breeding program for, you know, commercial and in a way, I'm also thankful for that because um, in tropical places, you know, Brazil is not all tropical. Uh, we do have areas that are much cooler, but um, in tropical places, sometimes if you don't keep on working with those um, varieties, they, they may not work for you. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I feel like it's really important to have those regional groups working with seed because otherwise uh, you lose it. Yeah, it, I mean, I think it happens just all over the place. Mm. It sounds like something that both, that both you, Daniela and Kelly, what you're both, so both are saying is that heirlooms are not intended to be stagnant or that these the old varieties are meant to be continued because they always were for millennia, mm -hmm. worked with and selected and evolved. Is that a common thread that you both are, are seeing, feeling? Yeah, absolutely. I feel that, you know, with seeds in seed banks or germplasm banks, we lose so much opportunity for evolution, even within just one or two seasons. And particularly with um, so much climate instability, you know, when things come out of a seed bank, it's seems that they might not even be able to live in their original place anymore with so much change happening. So I feel like it's really critical that things are continuing to evolve in place with the communities that steward them. I see one question about whether or not there's an effect on peppers uh, from the terroir, the, you know, the soil themselves, oh, yeah. whether there's, you know, whether it's lime components or organic matter components, do you think there's any effect in terms of flavor, potency, vigor, those types of things? Absolutely. Yeah, one of the peppers that we worked with, um, the Guilin pepper, that region was known for having particularly salty soils. And so that, that we, were, we were wondering if that was um, something that was coming across actually in the variety that we were working with. Um, so I would say it's absolutely, it absolutely is evident. And I think it's interesting when those peppers or anything are grown outside of their homeland, you know, how do we experience the changing of that and how much of it is still retained? Allison. I wanted to add on to that a little bit. There was a question earlier on um, well, it was someone commenting more, but they were saying, uh, she was saying, it was from Dorothy, you know, she loved how you were talking about which characteristics are more important to preserve when growing seeds, um, like the flavor versus, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was something you were talking about with what do we want when we're reviving some of these um, varieties what do we want to look for? What do you feel? And maybe all three of you could talk about that. Like, what do we feel is the most important sort of characteristics? Is it preserving the um, variety just how it was or, you know, or recreating a particular cuisine? Or how do you feel about, um, what, what are you looking for when you're trying to grow things out? Daniela? 
Daniela, why don't you go first? Um, so for me, disease resistance is a big deal because if I cannot grow it, if I have to baby it, then it won't make mm -hmm. it clear. Um, but flavor is huge. So it mm -hmm. kind of goes together, yeah? Like if if it doesn't have a good flavor, like in the, in the, like the, the pepper that I was, I was talking about, if it doesn't have that flavor, I won't grow it. It's just not worth it. So I think it, it's it's the two things together that makes sense to, yeah. I would agree. Yeah, I think for me, I would say flavor, culinary use and flavor and nutrition, and then also resilience and adaptability. I'm, I feel like we're less concerned about seeing something preserved in the original form or shape that it was growing in its homeland perhaps even though those genetics and that diversity may be present in the seed we're less concerned about the particular particular same manifestation of um, the phenotype I feel like we're really looking at flavor nutrition and adaptability climate resilience yeah, and I, and I think for me, I just, just piggybacking on both those, without the tradition, the food use of the bean, in the case with this bean, it doesn't matter which bean it is. There's a thousand amazing beans. But without the food use and the appreciation of that tradition and or adapting them into new use, but for me, particularly like the tradition of bean hole beans, which is where beans are baked in the ground, in a fire in the ground, uh, in cast iron or clay pots, mm -hmm. uh, which was such a part of society. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. that to me, it wouldn't matter to me what bean, as long as people were part of that experience, because that's going to what make, makes people want to eat the bean or appreciate the bean is, is being part of that experience, being part of the cooking of the bean. So I feel like the culinary tradition, if the culinary tradition goes extinct, the seeds that, that inform that go extinct. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and our, our society is, in, you know, culture in America is at a, seems like it's got an amazing amount of diversity, but I reflect that like a hundred years ago, people could look at 50 different types of beans and tell you what their names were. So mm -hmm. like, what is diversity to us today is a different question, you know, of how we think of diversity versus how we actually interact with diversity and know it as know the flavor differences between each one of these beans knows this one is good if you want to do this this one is good if you want to do that so i'd love to see a, a movement uh you know really just focused on the tradition of cooking the beans regardless of the type and and having people get back into that hmm. regardless of the flatulence <laughs> well and ultimately that's why we're growing edible crops right is for the flavor and for the diversity of different uses um, in our kitchens. Um, now, of course, we need these other things in order to be able to have a successful crop. Um, we're coming down to the very end of our session here. And so I just uh, want to see if there's any more. Um, I I'm going to I'm going to stop with Phil's got one last question, which was um, he has seen a big push for early maturing and like sort of selecting for that. Um, mm -hmm. And are you seeing the same thing in the crops you're working with? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny to see some of these uh, crops, I'm gonna talk about peppers again, when uh, companies in the US are producing seed for peppers, for example, um, pushing for early maturity. For me, that doesn't mean anything because those peppers are perennial for me. <laughs> they, they don't oh. let them die. Um, they just, you know, a lot of the varieties just keep on going. That's how they're bred and kept um, in their, where they're from uh, as like a backyard plant that you can always pluck peppers from. So this idea of early, pushing for early maturity and yield, it's, it's not always great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say second what Danielle is saying because in commercial seed production, 
where you have a processing machine where you're just throwing a lot of peppers from a field into a machine that's chopping up the peppers and spitting out the seed, um, you're actually influencing the genetics if you're only, if basically the ripest seeds harvested at that moment, plants that are ripe at that moment, basically those are informing the ripest seed rather than maybe a pepper, those peppers that would have been ripe a week later would have been the right one. And so okay. there's also an element in that where seedy peppers win. Mm -hmm. So because if you're producing seed commercially, you're throwing them into a processor, they're spitting out a lot of seeds. The pepper plants that produced a lot of seed are the winners for the next generation. So this type of maintenance that Kelly and Daniela are talking about with like taste and observation and like involvement are really important to make sure that these other traits are not winning. That commercial that commercial mechanized production basically creates. So I just wanted to, there is a difference that how you grow seed and how you process seed affects a lot of these nuanced traits. And ripeness, earliness is one of them. You know, you can select for it and it can be negative. Excellent point. And what do we want? And and just our timing of, of selecting the seed makes a huge difference and what's going to be perpetuated for that particular variety for, you know, generations or, you know, plant generations one year uh, to come. So, um, all right, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. This has been so awesome. I, yesterday we didn't have hardly enough time for these Q and A sessions and this has been fantastic today. And I want to just give my greatest thank you to Heron, Daniela, and Kelly so much for uh, being willing to come in here and speak today. This has just been a great way to finish off the session. Thank you. Thank you all.